So hello and welcome to the Elect Me Supreme Overlord of the Universe campaign trip. Head go. Um, I wish to thank all of you for volunteering for my campaign. And I know you're probably wondering what you can possibly do to get me elected. So I'm here to show you how. Okay. First of all, you need a little background on U.S. elections. When you think about voting, you think it should be as simple as votes candidate equals votes candidate plus one. This is what voting in the U.S. really looks like. Um, we are an amazingly decentralized system. We have federal laws that apply, but the federal laws are mainly for, to guarantee certain things like access to the polls and anonymity. Um, then we have state laws that apply. 50 different sets of them. As a matter of fact, in each state, whoever's in charge of the election may be a different person. Some states is the secretary of state. Some states is the lieutenant governor. Some states it's some appointed election official. And all of the laws are different. But elections aren't held at the state level. They're held at the county level. And there are over 3,000 counties in the U.S. So it's the county election officials who determine which vendor they're going to buy the equipment from, how they're going to set up this equipment, what the ballot design is pretty much going to look like. Some of that is statewide, but, but ballots differ. Um, they, they're the ones that register the voters. They're the ones that set up this horrifically complex database. Um, and, of course, there's like plus 3,000 of them. But you see, elections aren't held at the county level either. It's the precincts where you go to vote. And every single precinct in the U.S. is different because my dog catcher isn't the same as yours. And our school board members are not the same as yours. And my referendums aren't the same as yours. So a U.S. ballot can have as many as 11 pages of, of you know, single lines or, or paragraphs that you have to read and vote. And it's extremely confusing. So I want to... Um, I want you to think about voting in the U.S. instead of as just picking a candidate and incrementing their votes by one as this huge, heterogeneous, highly um, loosely configured, distributed system. And it has all of the problems that any distributed system have. Now, I mentioned that there are different state laws and there are different federal laws. They do occasionally conflict. And my favorite example is the state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is one of the 39 states that re require that if you're voting on an electronic voting machine, one of those DREs, that they must have a paper trail. This is a good thing. We want there to be a paper record of the vote that you see on the screen. The problem is that the way that paper trails are implemented, they have timestamps, barcodes, um, they may have um, voter information on them, so they violate federal law in that they, they, they make it possible to match um, they also have serial numbers, so they make it possible to match a vote to a vote to the um, person who actually cast the vote, and that's against federal law. So Pennsylvania, in their wisdom, in order to keep the letter of both laws but the spirit of neither, decided that for every person who votes on an electronic voting machine in their state, they must have a voter verified paper audit trail, but they can't use it. And then, of course, there's this. Okay, for a, for a T-shirt, who can tell me what HAVA stands for and what it did? Okay, what does it do? Help America vote Republican. Act. <laughs> 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 Come get a shirt. That one's brilliant. Okay, so it was inflicted on us after um, the Florida 2000 fiasco. Um, so. What it did is it was a funded mandate, and funded mandates in the U.S. are very rare. It set aside a huge amount of money for these states to give to their counties to upgrade their voting systems immediately. They had a time limit of when they had to spend it. And so, of course, they all went to the people who were advertising, and, um, and they bought mostly touch screens and some optical scan systems. And that's pretty much why we're in the mess that we're in. So who are we and why should you be listening to me? My name is Sandy Clark, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania studying under Matt Blaze, who's pretty well known in the hacker community. Um, we were hired along with Pen Patrick McDaniel's people at P Pennsylvania State University and Giovanni Vigna's people. And he's here, actually, um, at the con. Um, they're from UC Santa Barbara, but they have a private pen testing company, and they did all of our red teaming. 
Um, we were hired by Secretary of State Jennifer Brenner to do a complete in-depth analysis of all of the Ohio voting machines. Um, now, in the U.S., there are four major vendors of voting machines, and they are in order of market share. Election Software and Systems, Premier, which is the f company formerly known as Diebold, because, of course, changing your name fixes all of your problems. Um, and between them, they have a little over 80% of the market. The other two um, companies are Hart InterCivic and Sequoia Systems. Ohio uses ESNS, Diebold, and Hart. They do not use Sequoia. But last summer, um, Secretary of State Deborah Bowen, who's the Secretary of California, um, commissioned a similar study, the, the California Top to Bottom Study, in which my advisor, um, Matt Blaze, was the team lead that studied the Sequoia systems. So between the California Top to Bottom Study and the Ohio Everest Study, every major vendor of voting systems has had an in-depth analysis of their source code, their hardware, their procedures, their documentations, and they've all been red teamed. So, oh, um, while there's no correlation between lines of code and, um, and market share, there is a connection between two of these companies. For a t-shirt, can anybody tell me what the connection between ESNS and Diebold is? This is imp Come get your shirt. Um, ESNS was started by Bob and Todd Yurosevich, their brothers. Bob left and spun off a company called Diebold. So 80% of the votes that are tallied in a U.S. election are tallied on, on systems sold by companies owned by brothers. It gives a new meaning to the term family values. <laughs> so what exactly is a voting system? And this is where I have to dig out my really cool super NSA laser pointer. Um, in a voting system, only those two parts. Oh, sorry. In a voting system, only those two parts, which are the um, touch screen and the um, precinct optical scanner, are actually touched by the voters. Everything else is part of the back-end system, and that includes um, Windows servers running um, XP or Windows 2000, um, database software, um, all sorts of removable media, CF cards, PCMCIA cards, even zip disks. And just it, it's a horrifically complicated Rube Goldberg system. So the, the three things that everybody are familiar with are the electronic um, voting machines, which this has this ridiculous name, DRE, um, the precinct optical scanners, which is where you fill out a paper ballot and you go take it over to the scanner and you put it in and you know right away whether your ballot was accepted or, or rejected, and the centrally counted optical scanners, which are mostly used for um, absentee votes and for um, provisional voting. So you want to know what we found? <laughs> the first thing that we found is that special interest groups don't want you to get any work done. We were hired to start in September, and for the first four weeks, everybody battled back and forth as to whether or not they were going to let us publish. Um, Patrick, Matt, and Giovanni lost days of sleep going back and forth over this because they weren't not going to let us sign anything until we had control over our publishing. We did actually win. Everything that we found is in the report, um, except for the actual examples of source code, and those are in a private annex, but there are pointers to them, so you know what we found, you just don't know exactly how they wrote it. And you guys know what that stuff looks like anyway. But because we only had, um, we were hired for three months, and we had a hard deadline. We had to, to finish all, all of our um, finding and write a 300-page report. Um, in 10 weeks, and we were so worried that we wouldn't have enough time to find anything. But we did manage to find a few things. And here's a list. <laughs> I apologize for the small font, but I couldn't get them to fit on the screen. Um, so the, the blue teams were made up of 13 people, 10 weeks, and 700,000 lines of code in ESNS. When we combine Hart and Premier with that, 1.4 million lines of code that we had to go through. 
We could not follow any set methodology. We had to hack it. Um, so basically, we threw darts, and wherever a dart landed, somebody went and looked. And luckily for us, the systems were such crap that um, we could not find things. Um, so um, what, what exactly did we find? Just what you'd expect. Think back to your middle school intro to programming class, and your, your teacher telling you things not to do, it's in this code. It's just bad. I know seven, what, seventh graders that write better code than this. And besides, it was a bazillion languages, even COBOL, of all things, all, all in a mishmash. Um, so rather than give you any sort of spe specific examples, which would really violate the, the non-disclosure agreements anyway, um, you know what a buffer overflow looks like. You know how to implement a SQL injection attack. Instead, I want to lead your, your thoughts on, along a different path. I'd like to examine these voting systems as part of a distributed system instead of as individual attacks. You see, when academics, and I, I don't know how this is in, in the corporate world, but when academics find problems with, a, with a, a corporate piece of software, we'll approach the vendors and we'll tell them. And the first thing they try to do is trash our names and discredit our research. But when they can't do that, then you get this sort of nebulous response from them. They say things like, well, there's absolutely no way a malicious attacker is going to get close enough to our so source code to implement this relatively unimportant vulnerability. We have all these other security procedures in place. And these other security procedures include things like, oh, physical security, har hardware authentication tokens, tamper evidence seals, passwords, encryption. You know, all very valid items that you want in your security toolbox. But the problem is that this is a system, not an individual thing, and they don't act by themselves. They do interact. And that results in serious, serious breaches in security. So we'll start with physical security because those of you who know me know me in locks. Um, if any of you remember this photograph, about a year or so, Princeton was playing around with, with Diebold voting machines, and one of their sysadmins, not one of their, their, their researchers, but one of their sysadmins, noticed the key looked familiar. He went home and he brought back the key to his home minibar, and it is so familiar, it's identical. Um, so if you have a home minibar, there's a 90% chance that you can unlock a Diebold voting machine. But guess what else your minibar key will unlock? Ballot box on the left, heart intercivic, ballot box on the right, Diebold Premier, same key. <laughs> so maybe they got them on sale. Um, ESNS does not use the same keys, but they use exactly the same crappy design principle. Um, they are also cheap filing cabinet wafer locks. Um, you can buy them anywhere, you can buy the keys anywhere. Um, they use two keys. One unlocks the electronics and the other one unlocks the ballot box. Um, if you don't want to bother to buy a key, Devint Olaf has a brilliant way to make a key from a picture of a photograph or printout of a photograph and a Guinness can. So ask Devient to show you how. But if you don't want the key, you can just pick the locks. You see, Ohio didn't send us the keys for the first five days. So in order for us to, to turn the machine on at all, we had to pick the locks. Paper clip and a little jiggling. The real problem with these three um, vendors' choice of, of locks and keys is, oh God, you can't make this stuff up, um, <laughs> that, that they use exactly the same key. I'll give you the part numbers if you like, but if you've got the key to a machine in California, you've got the key to the machine in New York and Florida and Alaska and all over anywhere that they sell these machines. It's the same key. So. What about the tamper evidence seals? Ohio's procedures specifically state that when the removable media is inserted in the slot, that slot has to be covered with a tamper evidence seal. Now, the removable media is used for a number of things, including loading the firmware and storing and tallying the votes and the audit trail. Okay? So this machine was set up for us by Ohio, and exactly as it was used in the last election, and you can notice that it's got one of these really nifty little blue tamper evidence seals on it. How good are these seals at detecting evidence of tampering? You tell me. Now you have to raise your hands because otherwise I can't get you your t-shirts. For a t-shirt, somebody give me a way to remove these seals undetectably. Hair dryer works great. Come get it. Come get one. Um, peel them off with what? 
Um, thumbnail works actually, um, if you watch the, the video Hacking Democracy, the DVD, um, Hari, come, Hari Hersey actually um, peeled them off using the, the earpiece of his glasses and then pasted it onto a strip of ones that had never been used and then had the elector, Florida election officials try and find it and they couldn't. Okay? Any other ways? Go ahead. Um, water won't work because it'll smear. Um, that's sort of like peeling it off, right? No. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I got, I got one more T-shirt left. Anybody else? Way back in the green shirt. Thank you. That's <laughs> we are the ones at the strip. We ordered 500 of those, really cheap, and and you <laughs> and you can get them with any any serial number that you want. By the way, the use of these tamper evidence seals allows for a very fun um, denial of service attack. If people in your precinct are going to vote for the wrong person, um, election workers are taught to look for an intact seal. A broken seal implies a compromised machine. So go around breaking all the seals, and they, their votes won't be counted. <laughs> we don't want tamper e evident. We want tamper resistant. So maybe it's too much trouble to remove the seals, and it's too hard to get a key or pick the locks. You can always just access one of the many open and unprotected ports. <laughs> Ethernet ports, modem ports, serial ports, parallel ports. Every single vendor has at least one that you can get access to. Um, some of them are hidden behind the crappy locks, but most of them are just there like this. So Secretary of State Brenner told us that until she had seen this photograph, she hadn't understood what her own election officials had been telling her. Her people had been watching Regular voters on election day walk up to these machines and pull out that plug. And what happens when you do that? First of all, you disable your audit trail. And second, you get access to the serial port. So, so that leaves us only one real other form of security. Oh, oh I forgot. There, I, do you remember this photo from, I think it was DEF CON 12. Um, I, I borrowed this from Major Malfunction, who gave a great talk on how to own anything infrared. The ESNS top of the line touchscreen machines are entirely controlled through infrared. <laughs> Unfortunately, they also have a read switch, so you can't do it from very far. You also need a magnet. I'll get more on that later. But yeah. yeah. So what about the hardware authentication tokens? And this is important. All of the vendors require some form of hardware authentication token in order to have full control of the machine. Um, but the one, that one there, and this one there, this is Heart InterCivic's Spirus key, and this is Diebold Premier's um, Smart Card Encoder and Smart Voter Cards. Both of those are available commercially. Um, they have very little, if any, um, crypto on them. You can just put on them whatever you want. Get a hold of one, um, write, write your own stuff. They're hell of e easy to program, and get them. Now, this box over here, is a little bit more problematic. That is ESNS's Personal Electronic Ballot, or PEB, and you've got to have one of these. Um, they, um, you can't boot the machine without it. You can't upload firmware without it. You can't zero out the vote totals. You can't um, start an election. You can't close an election. You can't collect all the votes. You've got to have one, and they are not available commercially. We did try. However, I did here about three months ago, someone stole some of them in Pittsburgh, so you might be able to find them on eBay. Um, but you know, we're hackers. In our community, if you can't buy something, how do you get a hold of it? You have to... Thank you. We made ours with a palm and a magnet. Okay? Any infrared transmitter will do. We probably could have used a TV remote control. Um, and that's it for the hardware authentication. So that leaves us just passwords and just encryption. This would be great. I have to tell you, I'm a, I, I get kind of depressed about this, but um, I have to laugh or else I'll cry. Um, every vendor sells at least one machine that uploads firmware without asking for any password authentication whatsoever. If you can stick your removable media into that machine, it will run whatever you give it. In every case, 
the um, default passwords are ridiculously easy to guess. As a matter of fact, let, let's do a little test. Everybody shout out at once what you think the Diebold default password is. One, two, three. Password. It's Diebold. Um, so, um, and in the cases where, where the, def and the default passwords are rarely changed. In the cases where they are changed, they're easily crackable. Sometimes they're only six characters long. So, oh, and you know what? They hard code passwords. So the heart, intercivic, hard coded password is a five letter word that means stupid. <laughs> um, in the ESNS, I'm sorry, because this is just awful. In the ESNS, we found a comment next to the hard-coded password, and it stated, I kid you not, we hard-coded this password so that hackers couldn't use it. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Um, in the places where they use encryption, they use very bad encryption. Um, well, for example, um, Diebold machines use a password to encrypt the connection between the smart card and the actual um, DRE. One smart card means one voter can cast one ballot. That's a good thing. We want this to be encrypted. They also use a password to encrypt the communication between the DRE and the removable media. This, um, do I have my... This is actually a PCMCA card from an Ohio um, Diebold voting machine. So that's also a good thing. We want them to encrypt that. We don't want it to be easily accessible and altered. Um, they use a third password to encrypt those keys and store them in a file on the DRE, and this is a bad thing. You see, they derive that password from the serial number on the side of the machine. Um, Heart InterCivic, they don't use a smart card. They use a PIN number. And one PIN number equals one, one voter can cast one ballot. And when you first turn on a Heart InterCivic machine, the system is, is um, networked and everything, um, which is another bad thing. Um, when, you, when you first turn it on, the first PIN number of the day is generated using a decent random um, generator. Every single subsequent um, voter code is generated using a very predictable algorithm. So if you know one voter code, you can predict all the next ones and vote as often as you like. I think that if parents really loved their children, uh, uh, they would drum into their wee little brains, along with the um, never takes candy from strangers, never use homebrew crypto. No. So you don't... <laughs> Yeah, I love this photo. Um, you don't have to worry about the passwords or the encryption because there are back doors into the system. And you can get a great deal of flack from telling a vendor that you found a back door. But I don't know what else you can call an intentionally coded function that when it is called provides its user with complete root access to the system and it doesn't require a password. That's my definition of a back door. So let me give you two examples. The Heart InterCivic precinct um, and, opt and, and central election headquarters optical scanners allow you to run test elections. And this is good because you want to verify that the optical scanners are counting the ballots correctly. So in test mode, in order to save you from writer's cramp, you can print out as many ballots as you want that are pre-configured with your candidate's ovals already filled in. Um, so you could do a thousand or ten of thousands of these, run them through the optical scanner, and it will count them, and you can determine whether the count is accurate. Fine. In real election mode, um, you can run those pre-configured ballots through, and the optical scanner will actually spit them out and not allow them to be counted. However, in the software, there's the option to turn that check off. So you can actually flip that little um, bit, turn the check off, run tens of thousands of pre-configured ballots with your candidate going to win through the scanner and there's no way for, the, for them to tell the difference. Uh, let's see, ESNS has another one. Um, you remember that little box, that personal electronic ballot thingy? Well, in the documentation, they list three of them. 
There's a blue one. The blue one is a voter peb. That allows one voter to cast one ballot. There's a red one. The red one is a supervisor peb. That allows the poll worker to open and close the polls and collect the votes and reset the passwords if necessary. There's a yellow peb. That's usually used by um, the vendor representatives if there's a problem with the machine, and that resets everything back to its, its default state. It turns out, not in the documentation, there's a fourth kind of PEB. And this PEB gives you complete root access to the machine, and it doesn't require a password. You just stick it in the slot, and you have root. I don't know what color it is, but ours was black. <laughs> so once you've got access to these machines, <laughs> This is my um, tribute to Pirate Radix. Um, uh, once you have them, what can you do with them? Anything you damn well please. Here's a photograph of our little um, Palm Peb emulator resetting all of the um, passwords to Everest. Here's an example of one of the Election Central big batch scanners. Um, excuse me. Um, displaying our Everest software. Very happily, I might add. Here's an example of the Heart InterCivic machine running Penn State's um, own versions of firmware. Um, you notice the Penn State logo? We, we were going to put um, the University of Pennsylvania logo on there, but ours is a Quaker, and that just doesn't have quite the same intimidation. <laughs> um, so what does that leave us? That leaves us with paper ballots and optical scanners. So I'm going to show show you a couple of flaws with these. But don't get me wrong, this is still the best that we've got, okay? Um, and we can talk more about that later. So the electronic machines, the DREs, are just broken. There's absolutely no way that we can recommend using them. We can't recommend any fixes for them. Um, the paper ballots have some serious flaws as well. Um, they rely for their security on a special type of ink. And this special type of ink is called a non-read ink because it's absolutely invisible to scanners. And so what happens is that, though you can't, re you can't tell, um, that little box is printed in special non-read security ink. And further down on the ballot, there are some other boxes that are also printed in special non-read security ink while the rest of the ballot is printed in regular ink. Uh, the scanner is programmed to recognize where the dark spaces and the white spaces should be. So if you um, try and make a copy of this ballot, your copy machine or your printer will print the whole thing out in regular readable ink, and you'll put it through um, your optical scanner, and the scanner will look at this and see dark spaces where it should have seen white spaces, and it'll spit it out, and it'll print across its little LCD screen, possibly counterfeit. Oh, by the way, these scanners spit the ballots out so fast they are dangerous to stand next to. Um, when we were testing different weights of cardstock just to see what we could get through the system, the heaviest weight cardstock went through the machine so fast it made a dent in the machine across the room. Um, we really wanted to try sharpened sheet metal, but we ran out of time. <laughs> so, so how do you forge one of these ballots with this non-read security ink? white out. Um, just blot out the parts that, are, that, that the scanner shouldn't see, make as many copies as you want, and stuff the ballot box. This ballot was accepted as um, valid by both the precinct-based scanner and the election central big batch scanner. It can't tell the difference. Where do you get this so-called white out technology? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you might argue that um, that, okay, if we, we want to forge a ballot, we want it to look like a real ballot. The, the average age of a poll worker in this country is 75 years old. Voting, election day starts at 5.30 in the morning, and by the time they're counting ballots, it's what, 11.30 at night? Um, so they're not going to notice any difference. Um, besides that, the ballot for my precinct is different than the ballot for your precinct. So if they're going to an, in, into a county where the, which may have hundreds of precincts, um, since election law states that there has to be a precinct within walking distance, um, they're not going to notice any difference. 
But if you want to get picky, okay, you have to put the non-read sections back. And that means you have to get a hold of this really special security ink. Now, you've seen this ink on a lot of things. Um, if you have an, a mortgage, um, you might have seen, or a car deed, you might see it on the deed. Usually you'll see it in yellow or you'll see it in, in red. It's possible to get a hold of the yellow and red, but it is almost impossible. I, I tried for a, a week or so um, to, and I'm pretty good at finding shit. Um, I tried to, to get a hold of the black ink. There seems to be only one place that sells it. They only sell in big batches and they only sell to known customers. But in our world, if you can't buy something, how do you get a hold of it? You make it. We made ours with the cheapest inkjet cartridge we could find at CVS. So, you know what non-read ink really is? Ever run out of black ink cartridge on black ink in, in your, your inkjet and have it have to make ink out of the other three colors? That's all you do is take a paintbrush, dip it in all the holes, smear it around until it gets to the to be the right color, and okay, it's an ugly looking splotch. I got a C in art. Um, but that ballot was accepted as valid. Um, th this, this composite ink that your, your nice little printer will make for you if you run out of black is exactly the same thing as this high security ink. Um, yeah, you can, so what, what you do is print, print the ballot first with all the black spots using your black ink cartridge, take the black ink cartridge out and print the... Exactly. You, well, you, yeah, you just have to, have to program it to let it know which one should be which. Um, it's, it's painless. Oh, by the way, the use of this ink makes for another interesting denial of service attack. Denial of service by gel pen. You see, this non-read ink, um, the reason it can't be read is because it doesn't contain carbon. And most gel pens also don't contain carbon. So if you'd like to disenfranchise a lot of voters who are going to vote for the wrong person, have a bunch of pens made up with that person's logo on them, stand outside the, voting, the precinct and hand them out to whoever will take them. They'll mark their ballots with them, and those ballots will not be counted. And <laughs> and I'll tell you, it will not cause any alarm. Though it, when ballots aren't counted, it is called an undervote. Undervotes happen all the time. Um, there was actually a lawsuit in Florida um, a year or so ago because a woman running for Senate, um, in a, she was Democratic um, and she was in a Democratic precinct and the normal average um, undervotes is about 3% and suddenly this precinct showed up with 13% of where people just hadn't bothered to vote for her at all or vote period. That, that, that vote was apparently blank. Um, and a number of very well-respected researchers, two of whom worked on the California Top to Bottom Study, were hired to, to try and see whether there was any malicious, um, any evidence of, of maliciousness in this, and they couldn't find anything that they could prove. So denial of service seems to work very, very well. So what else can you do? Well, this, this is what we found the first time we turned the machine on. You can simply recalibrate the touch screen by touching to the wrong point, and you can make it impossible to vote for any candidate. Um, you, know, you know how to uh, recalibrate a touch screen. There's a little X, and you touch the X. Just touch it someplace bizarre on the screen, and the vote will never count. Uh, what else can you do? Um, this is a Diebold smart card encoder. Buy one of these off of eBay. Hold down the... Turn it off, turn it on holding the on key and the yes key, and you can program for as many unlimited votes as you like. Yeah, it's that hard. Um, so you can cast multiple votes, you can erase the audit logs, disable the, um, the audit trail, zero the totals, anything you damn well please. This picture, by the way, is an example of what happens if a toddler spills a sippy cup on the, on the audit trail. So, <laughs> I think what they did is they just held up a straw and, and dripped down on it. So I started out my talk telling you that I wanted to discuss the idea of the security of voting machines as part of a distributed system. And I've spent this entire talk showing you example of an example out an example of individual attacks. 
But I maintain that I have been discussing the security of a distributed system, and here's why. The risk of viral propagation. You see, we demonstrated that it was possible for a, sing a per single person of, with either voter access or poll worker access to upload malicious code onto either, either an electronic DRE or onto an optical scanner system that they had in their local precinct. At the end of the election, that malicious code can write itself onto the removable media. When the polls are closed, that removable media is taken out of those machines and it is sent back to Election Central, which is at the county headquarters. Um, at that point, it can exploit one of the many, many, many vulnerabilities that are in the election database software and in the Windows 2000 and Windows XP software that the servers themselves run. And it can upload itself onto that, and then it controls the votes of the entire election. It also controls the audit trail. If you don't think that's important, let me remind you that in 2004, the entire country waited to hear the results of the election in the state of Ohio. Ohio was waiting to hear the results of one county, Cuyahoga County. Uh, I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> um, Cuyahoga County determined who got Ohio's electoral votes, and that determined who became president of the United States. Um, one voter really can make a difference. Um, and that's not the worst case scenario. You see, these machines aren't used once and just thrown out. Um, this was a funded mandate in order to buy these machines in the first place. The, the counties actually got money from the federal government. That has never happened before, and that will never happen again. They are not going to charge their taxpayers money to replace these machines. So this same database system is used to program all of the voting machines for the next election and the next election and the next election. The lever machines were in use for over 40 years. Who knows how much longer um, we're going to be stuck with this shit. Um, and even that isn't the absolute worst case scenario. Now, I admit this is a long shot, but you see, the back-end database systems are so complicated and so difficult to set up. The um, documentation leaves out specific steps. So the vendors actually have a second revenue source. They set up the elections for the individual counties. They either send their representation, re representatives to the county headquarters to set up the election, or the county set, send their voting information back to the, the vendor headquarters, and the vendors set up the election for them. So in the absolute worst case scenario, we've got a vector that goes from one voter in one podunk little precinct in some tiny little county in some Midwestern state back to ele Election Central in, in the county headquarters and from there to the vendor and from there to every machine that they sell. It is a worst case scenario, but we're talking about the elections in one of the biggest and most important countries in the world. That has to be something considered. So, one of the um, responses that we got from the vendors when we published our report was, well, these are just a bunch of eggheads sitting in an ivory tower. None of this stuff is practical. I remind you, Giovanni Vigna and his WebWise security people red teamed everything. They demonstrated they did not have access to the source code. All they had was access to the, to the same machines a voter would have or a poll worker would have. And they were able to carry out this virally propagated attack. Um, part of our mandate with Ohio was to provide mitigation strategies and recommendations. In most of the cases, it's so broken, we could not. Our best recommendation was scrap it and start over from scratch. So what do I want you to do? I want you, first of all, to vote. I realize that I've just told you um, what's wrong with voting, but there are a lot of issues. Consider the wiretapping stuff, the um, motion picture copyright stuff, um, 
them going through your laptop at any border. These are issues bef up before our Congress right now, and we really, really need clueful people involved. So I do, do hope that you will vote in this election if you're a U.S. citizen. <laughs> I leave that up to your wisdom. Um, I want you to become poll workers. As I said before, <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah, you get it. Uh, I love you guys. <laughs> As I said before, um, the average age of a poll worker is 75. They are simply not equipped to understand the technology and to recognize when there are problems and to fix them um, when they happen. Your counties need your technical expertise. You get two hours of training, you get uh, maybe $150, um, and you get one exhausting day, but you might also get the machines in your living room the night before the election. I know, uh, and I'm speaking from, from actual knowledge, I know people who had eight machines in their, in, overnight. Um, the last thing we can do, really, is we have to build a better system. We've got to get involved. We have got to build something open source that runs on an open source platform, not on proprietary hardware like all of the voting machines are. And like anything, until we reach critical mass, until enough of us get involved in this, nothing is going to change. Uh, but, but we can change the world. We did it with Linux. Um, why can't we do it with voting as well? Um, Ka Ping Yi, who worked on the California voting system, actually his thesis is a 461 line um, Python voting system that so far seems to be very, very secure. So we don't even need to do 700,000 lines of code. The last thing I want you to do is to remember <laughs> to elect me Supreme Overlord of the Universe. But you know what? Even if you don't, I'm going to win anyway. So we actually have some time for questions if anyone would like to ask. Yes. Can you, uh, can you use a mic? Is there a mic? Yes. The, uh, he asked, is the report available online? If you go to the Secretary of State of Ohio's website um, and you look under elections, all of the reports are there, um, and ours was the academic report. So look for academic. How, how many states are the DRE? Uh, ESNS claims that they, that they are, are um, used in 43 states. Um, Diebold is used in about that, that many as well. Um, now, what's interesting is that um, Secretary of State Brunner, while not, not a technical person, really um, did the right thing. After the report um, was turned in um, and she was getting a lot of flack from, from a bunch of people, she decided to push for the removable, uh, removing of all of the electronic machines in Ohio. So they are going to, she went beyond our recommendations actually, they are going to use paper ballots and centrally um, counted um, optical scan systems. California is doing the same thing. Um, and surprisingly, God, and this really threw me, Texas is looking to get rid of their um, DREs and, and go to completely optical scan as well. Who'd have thought? Um, yes? How feasible is an attack on the optical scans modem back um, If you can get access to it, you control it. There's no protection against it. Um, so if, it, it might be hidden behind some of those crappy wafer locks. It might not, depending on... on but, but there is absolutely no... The optical scanners have no protection against your uploading whatever firmware you want. No. Say again. Okay. So the question is, do I think that write once memory might help strengthen audit trails? It would be. It certainly be worth testing. I could never prove any maliciousness. I can tell you that the code is very poorly written. So there's definite, definite signs of incompetence. Um, there's no proof uh, of any, any form of maliciousness. But <laughs> proof of greed? 
if if you can say um, getting something that is not ready f um, for prime time out and sold on the market to um, 80 or 90 percent of the different states, greed, yes. Huh. Oh, five minutes. Go ahead. Okay, so he's asking whether or not um, there should be a single vendor for every state so that every, everything is the same and everyone understands how it works, or whether you should have multiple vendors. I don't think that that is ever going to happen, that would have a single vendor, because um, most state and federal laws require that you accept bids from a number of different vendors. The thing is, is that whoever is, is in charge of the elections, be it the Secretary of State or, or Lieutenant Governor or whatever like that, has people test the machines and then certifies which machines are allowed to be sold in that state and which versions of software they're allowed to be running. Um, and then the software is supposed to be in escrow and things like that. So I, whether um, one system is better than, than several, I couldn't say, um, because they're all just bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Um, behind you first. Um, the state of Ohio right now, Jennifer Brenner just de is, is, has a suit with Diebold because um, what, they, what they discovered when they tried to upload the votes into their um, back-end database system was that the removable media suddenly was missing votes. And Diebold is currently claiming that that's a result of the antivirus software that was running on the servers. Um, so... <laughs> So while there have not been any class action lawsuits by, by the public, there have been some brought by EFF, there have been some brought by um, the states themselves, and there have been some brought by, by some special interest groups like um, Black Book Box Voting and a few other like that. Ah, he said there's at least two vendors that have gone under because of lawsuits. Um, so we're pretty much out of time. Um, but, but we'll be in questioning in the room across the hall. I think it's 109. So um, feel free to come and, and let's chat. So.